not, we just uh, start introducing you to our two next panelists. Um, uh, uh, first, we're going to have Dr. Garcia Casorla, Angels. Uh, Garcia Casorla, uh, she's joining us uh, from Barcelona also. She's a child uh, neurologist uh, specialized in metabolic diseases, and she is in a lot of panels of rare diseases too. Um, she is one of the leading doctors or the PA principal investigator in the serine clinical trial. Um, and she would tell us a little bit of, more about the function of the uh, NMDA receptor associated with child symptoms and possible treatments. Um, and then right after that, we're going to hear from Na Natalia Julia, uh, who also works at, as a child neurologist, who also works at the Children's Hospital here in Barcelona, this uh, Hospital San Juan de Deu. Um, and she will talk um, about the tolerable, uh, the sorry, the serine clinical trial, um, which actually carries the title of tolerability and efficacy of L-serine in patients with green-related encephalopathy. So, um, with no more delay, I'll just leave you with uh, Dr. Garcia Casorla. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra, for the introduction and also for the invitation to, to participate in meeting today. Um, okay, so uh, Sandra asked me to talk about function of NMDA receptors, clinical symptoms and treatments, so about everything. <laughs> and, but uh, in fact, I, I will try to give a, a, an overview and, and uh, uh, focusing on, on clinical aspects and, and treatments, although I will just say a word about function of, of NMDA receptors. Um, Dr. Altafaj already um, explain a lot of things very nicely, so I will go very quickly to those aspects that have been already mentioned. Uh, function of NMDA receptors, clinical symptoms and treatments, so about everything. <laughs> and, but uh, in fact, I, I will try to give a, a, an overview and, and uh, uh, focusing on, on clinical aspects and, and treatments, although I will just say a word about function of, of NMDA receptors. Um, Dr. Altafaj already um, explain a lot of things very nicely, so I will go very quickly to those aspects that have been already mentioned. So, well, you know that neurons use uh, neurotransmitters, and and they, well, we, we can in fact um, compare um, uh, the the, and the the neurotransmitter when they bind to the receptor to a key that uh, uh, goes to a lock, bids to a lock. So um, in fact, NNDA receptors are glutamatergic receptors, so they use glutamate as a neurotransmitter. Here we have the molecule of glutamate, and they go to uh, a, a sort of receptors that are not only NNDA receptors, but um, a group of receptors that can be divided into ionotropic receptors, as you can see here, the NNDA, but also AMPA or kinet receptors. Ionotropic receptors are characterized be, um, by the, the, um, because they can use or, or ions can stimulate ions such as magnesium or calcium or others uh, can stimulate uh, these uh, receptors and are uh, also channels. They, they are, um, I mean, classified as channels. Uh, there are other kind of receptors. We are not going into the details, but in fact, glutamate when um, uh, this neurotransmitter bins to, to these receptors uh, um, a response to the postsynaptic neuron is triggered, so um, uh, excitability uh, is produced uh, in neurons. Uh, glutamine is the main excitatory amino acid neurotransmitter in the brain. 90% of excitatory synapses use glutamate for neuronal communication, so this is really very, very important. Um, um, these NMDA, NMDA receptors are critical for many functions of the brain and in particular during development. They are involved in neuronal survival, in circuit formation, and very important in synaptic plasticity processes that are linked to learning and memory and behavioral aspects. That's why many of these children have uh, all these cognitive functions that are affected. Um, neurons communicate to each other in, in secrets that establish between them. It is not the simplistic picture of one neuron sends a message to the other, but is, is an interconnection, is more complex than that. And these uh, secrets have to 
to, to have a balance between, between inhibitory and excitatory transmission. We already said that glutamate is the most important excitatory transmission. When glutamate is released and, and goes to the postsynaptic neuron, there is a, an action potential that can be registered, so a, a, a signal, a message that is sent. So we can say that uh, excitatory communication mediated by um, a glutamate a, is the responsible of the, 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 the no, not the noise, but if, if, if we can compare this communication to a conversation, in a conversation we are saying some words, but we are also um, uh, making in some silence in order to have like uh, an harmony we we don't talk a lot a lot a lot all the time or very very high but we just need to stop a little bit in order to understand everything so the the words are glutamate and the silence are GABA are, are, are ruled or are uh, managed by GABA which uh, is the inhibitory um, neurotransmission and this inhibition makes the neuron stop a little bit this conversation and so the, the action potential is a little bit slowed down, a little bit blocked. So the, this is a perfect balance that is really very important during a neurodevelopment and, and in and almost every kind of neurodevelopmental disease there is a, an alteration of this balance between excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmission. So uh, we can compare neurodevelopment to an orchestra that has to be perfectly tuned and the silence has to be inserted into the, the music that multiple instruments are, are performing just to have a perfect harmony. If this is this magic uh, uh, um, uh, organization it doesn't work properly because some of the elements are disturbed, we can have very, very important um, neurodevelopmental diseases. So either in a gain of function or in a loss of function, uh, we will have an, a disturbance of this equilibrium, of this balance, because after the, 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 the receptor, when the glutamate uh, bins the receptor, we have a very complex ne network of chemical and cellular reactions that have to, to be, um, uh, that have to evolve in a very uh, natural, in a very organized and tuned way. Um, and th this is not only a question of one cell that communicates to the other or some groups of cells that communicate and, and, and have a conversation between them, but it's a question of a system, which is a nervous system. So there are secretors in the brain that are glutamatergic uh, secretors that use these um, glutamate and also NMDA receptors. And these are these secretors that are in the, in the mature brain, in the brain of, of an adult or, or even in a grown up child. So we have a cortical um, uh, sequence that go from the cortex here to the brainstem, which is here, but also to the cortex, to the estriatum, which are the basal ganglia that are responsible of movements. We have other cortical, cortical secrets, so a conversation between the cortex. So there are several secrets of, of, of glutamate and NMDA receptors, but th these NMDA receptors are not distributed in the same way during all development. Um, it, it has been already mentioned that um, for sure that there is a very important expression of these NMDA receptors prenatally in the brain, and then their expression decreases over time, leading to the localization of certain brain regions, as you can we can see um, here. So th there are few works trying to um, to to uh, show in, in humans in 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 animal models there are several uh, reports, but in humans there are a few uh, works that try to explain this evolution of these different subunits, and this is one of them. So at the beginning they go, as, as uh, Dr. Atafat just mentioned, more or less in parallel, but then there is a, a the, the, I mean, low, the, the green to be go um, uh, rather low in their expression, where uh, and, and in the opposite way, green to A go a little bit higher in their expression as, as time goes by and in different brain areas um, 
this is what happens during development. It is also our, an interesting um, article about um, a human fetal cerebral cortex. You know that cortex is the surface of the brain. If we can cut the brain like that, this is um, the, 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 the cortex, the surface, and then we have the white matter here. So um, the, this um, work shows that different subunits in the, in the of the NMDA receptors express in a different manner at different times of, of pregnancy. So in an NR2A it has a greater expression as 22 weeks compared to 17 weeks of gestation, and it's the opposite in NR2B. And it is interesting that uh, NR, NR1 is expressed in proliferative progenitors. Um, so the proliferative progenitors are the, the cells that are like the mother cells that can divide and then uh, move towards the surface and migrate. So it is interesting that uh, these receptors are also in the basis of, of the generation of, of, uh, of brain tissue and also organization of this brain tissue. This is why we can find also cortical malformations later on, as well. we, we will see. But glutamate is not alone in the brain, uh, but uh, it has to work together with other neurotransmitter systems, dopaminergic pathways, GABAergic pathways we already mentioned, and, and other cholinergic, other systems. We still don't know exactly all these connections between the systems, some of them we know, some others we don't know. And in particular, during development, the, there is a lot of work to do, still a lot of work in order to understand which is this, um, I mean, combination or interaction between glutamatergic and other systems. And for sure, the expression of NMDA receptors probably should be modeled by the, ex by the action of other neurotransmitters, not only glutamate. So what are the main messages of this very first part of my talk? And then the air receptors are ionotropic receptors, channels, glutamatergic receptors. Glutamatergic neurotransmission is excitatory and the most abundant in the brain. These receptors are widely distributed and regulated in time and space, not only at different stages of development, but also different areas of the brain. And these receptors are involved in very important functions of, of neurons. They are cru crucial functions of, of cognitive and, and behavioral functions. And this glutamatergic transmission should be integrated in the complexity of, of the brain as a system, and not only as, as a single uh, molecule or as a single receptor. And this is a very complex task task also to be to, to work in, in the future. So what about the symptoms? This is the second part of my talk. So we will move to the, the, the single neurotransmitter microcircuits to macrocircuits and these macrocircuits and the, the connectivity of the brain will be more related to the symptoms that we found in patients. So as we, we already showed this uh, slide in other talks, so uh, what, what we find in, in green related disorders is a spectrum of, of severity and spectrum of symptoms that go from the very severe encephalopathies that associate cortical malformation, severe epilepsy, all functions are disturbed, motor functions, the child can be will uh, chair bound and has a lot of problems of, of communication, severe intellectual disability, but other ca cases have only mild intellectual disability. In the middle, we have a different kind of, of, of symptoms, uh, neuropsychiatric problems, behavioral problems, autism or autistic-like behavior is also quite common. Movement disorders can be also a problem, although, and according to, to my personal experience, compared to other synaptopathies, because this is spectrum we found in all kinds of synaptopathies, we, we talk, um, we call synaptopathies mutations that appear in, in proteins that, that are in the synaptic cleft in this space, and even in the astrocytes too. And, and this is very common in all synaptopathies, but they express in a different manner depending on the gene that is a factor. Mm -hmm. And movement disorders are not really prominent in these in green disorders all the, uh, compared to other synaptic um, 
problems where they, they, they are major, major problems and very difficult to treat. So if we start from the first uh, report um, uh, by Dr. Endele uh, two, uh, 10 years ago, um, we found um, a group of, of important publications uh, from that time uh, until now that uh, have provided important also data about uh, clinical signs. And we know that there are probably more than now than 500 individuals with the green variants reported. Uh, so we will try to go to, to, to the main features of every variant. Uh, we have here a summary of all of them. And then I will try to go to the details, uh, in particular to those features that are probably more difficult for you to understand as patients. So GRIN1 is associated with mild profound developmental delay, severe intellectual disability, infantile onset seizures, Oculogeric crisis and bilateral polymicrogeria. This is probably one of the most severe associations that we found in, in green related disorders. So I will focus in because all, the, all these aspects you probably know, but I will go to the most difficult ones in order to explain what it is. Well, I will go to oculogeric crisis and bilateral polymicrogeria. I will try to understand, to explain a little bit what is polymicrogeria. Polymicrogeria is a neuronal migration disorder. I just mentioned um, some slides ago that uh, some receptors, uh, green and NMDA receptors in the, in the prenatal life of, of the brain are based here in the ventricular zone where neuronal progenitors are. These neuronal progenitors are mothers, are cell mothers that will um, 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 be divided and will form other, other cells and will migrate to, to, the very, to the most as, um, uh, external uh, layers of the cortex. And if this migration, if this travel is not organized properly, we have a disorganization of the cortex. This cortex is, ha has a, an abnormal shape, and for short, all the neurons that are here that are really important, uh, uh, GABAergic and glutamatergic neurons, don't work properly. So the control of cortical neuronal migration um, is, is the, it has very different molecular actors, but glutamine and GABA are important. And it occurs very early in life, between 12 and 20 weeks of prenatal life. So in green one, we can find this polymicrogeria in the surface of uh, cerebral hemispheres. And these are multiple small bumps, as you can see here suggesting an excessive number of gyri. There are too many, too many gyri, but they are not well organized. They are irregular, overfold, like festooned. And this polymicrogeria can be diffused, so all the brain can be affected, like in this picture, or only some areas are affected. These areas are really epileptogenic, very, very epileptogenic. Uh, an important proportion are perisylvian. These are perisylvian areas, the one that I, that I am showing here with the arrow. Uh, this has been um, uh, reported in Green One that uh, bilateral extensive polymicrogeria uh, can be uh, one of the features, as you can see here in, in the brain MRIs. And these children with this extensive polymicrogeria in general have global uh, neurological involvement, severe problems of development, and also severe problems of seizures. So, so probably these, these are the most severe uh, phenotypes. Oculogenic crisis, um, but, but for sure, not all patients with green worn have this uh, kind of abnormalities. This is some patients have, uh, may have that, but not all of them. And all of them may have also less severe forms, for sure. So the, this is also very common only in this subgroup of NNDA uh, receptor mutations, and it's the oculogenic crisis. And I will show you what it is. Oculogenic crisis are abnormal movement of the eyes, as you can see here in this video, that is a, a video that is a public access video. Look at this child with this sustained conjugate upwards deviation of the eyes. This can last seconds, but sometimes hours. In particular, it can last hours in this disease. This is not a, a green petit, this is an AADC deficiency, it's another kind of neurotransmitter disease. 
and, and it, it reflects, in, in fact, a dopaminergic pathway disruption. There are many other disorders that can um, have this clinical sign, but not many, but some of them. And we, as child neurologists, know uh, these this, this, uh, disorders. But in fact, uh, and, and patients with green one can have this um, this uh, abnormal eye movements, and in, in my my short experience seeing these patients compared to other causes of eye deviation, as you can see here, this these eye deviations are really slow, are slow, and in general they tend to be in this disease to the same direction all the time. It's like very stereotyped, uh, but it, the, the children that I see with green disease and these um, abnormal movements of the eyes are really fast and go in all directions. But this is a single observation and maybe it is not a generality. That, that's why deep phenotyping is very important in order to characterize different diseases from a clinical point of view and also uh, to establish some kind of uh, um, I mean, prognosis and, and for sure for treatments. In right green to A, normal or near normal development with mild epilepsy, speech delay, apraxia, to severe epileptic encephalopathy with epilepsy of aphasia spectrum has been uh, described. There is a, a recent very nice uh, paper by the group of uh, Dr. Lemke that explains a little bit all these signs and tries to correlate uh, with uh, some particular variants, those were, that are in transmembr term transmembrane and linker domain uh, have severe developmental phenotypes, also those uh, gain of function uh, mutations or have a more uh, severe uh, phenotype. Green to be a uh, green to be should be considered in cases with mild to profound developmental delay, intellectual disability, epilepsy, behavioral problems such as autistic like behaviors, hypotonia, movement disorders, and sometimes also cortical mal malformations and cortical uh, visual impairment. And this could be a cartoon of all things that we can find in green to be um, developmental delay, which is you know, or intellectual disability, which is almost constant in different degrees. Epilepsy, half of the patients can have epilepsy, autistic features, almost 30%. Motor signs are sometimes present. Hypotonia is an important uh, motor sign, but then hyperkinetic movements and other are not that common as in other synatopathies, as I already mentioned. And in some cases, uh, brain and cortical malformations are all also present, as we can see here in these brain MRIs with these uh, severe abnormalities, also polymicrogyria and some other cortical malformations that can be really very, very important. But, but most of them have normal or just very subtle changes at, at the, in the MRI. And some of these children have a, a, what we call a cortical visual impairment. That, that means that the eyes work properly, but because all the transmission from uh, to to the to the cortex. I mean, in fact, we the the, the we see with the brain. We, we need the eyes, but the the interpretation of the images um, takes place here in the occipital lobe. So, if the occipital lobe has some kind of micro abnormalities in terms of cortical organization, um, we can have this cortical visual impairment. So the child doesn't direct properly uh, the eyes to an object, doesn't follow properly. We can have also other causes. This is not the only one for sure, but um, sometimes this is the, the cortical visual impairment that produces this um, visual abnormality in, in children. Epilepsy can, can, is, is uh, diverse. Generalized seizures are the most uh, common, but then focal and epileptic spasms are, are also something common. Uh, focal seizures is uh, the, these seizures that are generated in a, in a particular area of the brain, and the EEG, uh, they uh, give spikes only in, in a particular area, whereas generalized uh, crises uh, activate, are an activation of the whole areas of the brain at the same time, and the, the, the general discharges are seen in the EEG. In a study uh, follow-up in 22 patients, 50% uh, become seizure-free over time. So sometimes uh, this is something that appears in a particular moment, but then uh, this, this epilepsy just uh, improves and this even disappears. 
Green to be uh, can also produce a landau klavner disorder, which is also found in other subtypes of, of green-related um, uh, uh, pathologies. And this landau klavner syndrome is what we call the epilepsy aphasia syndrome, and is a language regression of children of th between three and five years of age. And this language re re uh, regression is associated with seizures, with abnormalities in the EEG, and behavioral abnormalities. Yeah, then we have other kind of, of, of seizures. We, were, we are not going into the details. And th th in this recent paper of the group of uh, Chavi Altafaj, they tried to uh, just um, differentiate some um, uh, of these clinical uh, aspects. If we compare green to A with green to B, we see that epilepsy seems to be more common here, green to A. Uh, this is a short uh, series uh, of patients, but well, more or less it can be representative. Speech disorders are also more common in green to A. Autistic features are more common in green to B. So in spite of having an, an, an spectrum of clinical manifestations that are common, we can find some differences. And green to T, uh, to D, we, we had a little information of this uh, variant, but this group of, of disorders. But in, 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 during this year, we have had a couple of interesting papers, and this is one paper in, in brain that tried to illus illustrate, not in brain, this is the other one that is not in brain, in brain, and this is the, the other also important paper trying to illustrate a little bit uh, what kind of symptoms these children have. You can see here epilepsy types that is also diverse from ipsarrhythmia, which is a very severe EEG abnormality, sometimes related to a spasm, is a type of epilepsy, to multifocal discharges. And then you see here also cortical atrophy, so abnormal brain MRI abnormalities, autistic features, hypotonia in nine patients and, and refractory to anti-epileptic disorders, the epilepsy in, in also nine over 12 patients. So we need for sure more characterization. So this is again, like the, the message of this clinical description is, okay, we have an spectrum, but we have seen that some particular subgroups of disorders have some specific signs. And so th this is why it is very important to have a very informa information, clinical information of high quality in order to, to better characterize and to have a, a, a nice information not only about the presentation but about the natural history, the outcome, the evolution over time of these patients. And I, I move to the third part and the last part of my talk which are the treatments. And as, as uh, has been already mentioned, we try to organize the treatments um, according to the, uh, the mutations. If the mutations are a gain of function, we, give, we try to, to have an approach. If the mutations are a loss of function, the approach is different. So we'll start with the loss of function mutations. This, uh, in these loss of functions, it, it is, well, like logical that if we give some kind of uh, molecules that stimulate the, 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 the receptor that is not working properly, these uh, uh, molecules will probably have an effect to potentiate, to uh, stimulate the function because the receptor is moving very slowly, is going like, it's like a, a, a receptor that is tired and you need something to uh, stimulate, to push the receptor. So um, wh what can we do in this loss of function uh, mutation? So we can make the receptor work better through agonist bending, we can increase the expression of the receptor or we can use other mechanisms. These are some options. There are probably more than these options, but this is just to, to summarize some of, of the options that we can do already or uh, we are already doing. So there are um, uh, um, substances, molecules that make the, the receptor work better are elserine, that will be metabolized to disarine. Dr. Natalia Julia will, will tell you about the clinical trial that we are currently, um, uh, so it's, it's currently going on. Other molecules that are in development, also in, 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 in Dr. Altafaj lab, and positive allosteric modulators. We can increase the expression of the receptor and maybe piracetam is able to do that, and maybe because we have poor data supporting this, what well, poor data? few data support in this hypothesis or other mechanisms like the ketogenic diet. So 
I will just say a word about l -serine because my colleague will talk a lot about it. So l what that we give with the diet and we, as a supplement is convert to deserine in the, in the brain by an enzyme that is called racemase. And this deserine is, the, is a neurotransmitter that, go, that binds to the NNDA mutation uh, receptor and promotes the stimulation and makes this receptor works better. It is, in fact, a gliotransmitter because it is not synthesized in neurons but in glia cells that surround the, the, the synapses. And, um, and glutamate, interestingly, glutamatergic neurons are the primary site of the serine synthesis. Too. So this is very interesting and makes more sense in order to, to give l -serine to these patients. This, is, this comes from, from a paper that explains that um, deserine can be useful in the management of anxiety disorders, but now deserine, we, we know that it, it can have many clinical uh, applications, only as a cognitive enhancer in depression, for sleep disorders and for metabolic diseases. I mean, I think we, we should, in fact, write a review about all the, the potential um, utilities of, of uh, l -serine converted into d um, to to improve neurological conditions. What about paracetam? We, we, we mentioned that it can uh, stimulate, it can increase the, 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 the function of, of NMDA receptor also. It, it, paracetam is a nootropic, which is a cognitive enhancer. It was synthesized a long time ago, and it has many other functions, not only in, involving uh, NMDA receptors, but it stimulates also other um, neurotransmitter systems, the dopaminergic, noradrenergic, cholinergic. And what, what it, apparently uh, the, the action that is interesting for, the, for NMDA is that it increases the number of contacts between the, the receptor and the agonist. So it will um, increase the number of contacts between glutamate, for instance, and the NNDA, so it will improve the function of NNDA. This is the theory. Huh? We, we, there are very, very few studies uh, in, in, in this direction. Uh, so, uh, so far, has been is an, um, done. Uh, we, we give, uh, in fact, not um, piracetam in our in neuropediatrics for myoclonia, myoclonias. There are non non cortical myoclonus. There is a kind of movement disorders, and it works very nicely for that, or at least it works. Um, so um, the, the indications so far um, beyond these myoclonus are cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease and also the reversion of cognitive impairment that, that is seen in patients that, that, uh, who are for, for long periods in intensive care unit, and also students when they are in, a, in, 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 in exams, or they have tests, they, have, um, they, they are stressed, they have a lot of things, and they have to be very performance, they, use, they take it to increase attention, concentration, and academic performance. What about ketogenic diet? This is really, this is interesting and this is something that we are using more and more in our neuropediatric practice, not only in, in, in green pathies, but other, many other diseases. So it seems, and it has been demonstrated in, 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 in theoretical models, in, in, in animal models, that when the NNDA receptors are dysfunctional and NNDA are expressed in neurons, but are expressed also in a, a cell that is that uh, is a glial cell, the oligodendrocyte. The, oligo, the oligodendrocyte is a, a cell of the new, of the nervous system that is responsible for the production of myelin that surrounds nerves, and and and, and improves and, and facilitates nerve conduction. So these NMDA receptors, when they are not working properly, they don't work properly in all cells of the brain and also in oligodendrocytes. So when they are working in a normal way, it has been found that the transporters of glucose uh, that take glucose from the systemic circulation from what we eat and from our diet and bring it to the astrocyte and convert that in, in, in lactate for the neurons and so on. So these transporters of glucose are decreased. So we have less glucose in our brain. In th theoretically, if we have NMDA receptor mutations. In particular, it's, I suppose, but this is just uh, something that has not been demonstrated in loss of function, this should be more important, but, but I really don't know if this is true. Uh, we have found some, in some our, of our patients with uh, green pathies, and we, had, we just uh, 
uh, we are conducting a study of the CSF study, the lumbar puncture, to analyze the, the CSF um, and, and different molecules, we have found in some of them low values of glucose. So um, this can be uh, a little bit uh, true uh, in accord in according to this uh, explanation. So ketogenic diet is a, um, the main goal is to produce ketone bodies. So the diet has been mostly composed by fat. 90% of the total calories have been composed by fat. And then the relations between fat, proteins, and carbo carbohydrates can vary according to every patient or, or every disease. And it is very important. It has been controlled by should be controlled by health professionals. You, you cannot do that as a patient alone because it has, it has complications uh, if you do that by your own. It has to be controlled and monitored with different parameters. The main indication so far is refractory epilepsy, but we are using a, a ketogenic diet as a neuroprotector more and more, and in particular in very young children in order to change the, the natural history of diseases because uh, this ketogenic diet Im improves uh, many energetic functions of the brain, ketones. Glucose is a, a molecule that is important as an energy molecule for the brain, but ketones are the second one and lactate the third one. So these three molecules can be used to obtain energy. And the energy in molecular terms is ATP, is this molecule. So in ketogenic diet, we have more ATP, but then we have more GABA uh, functions. So we have a little bit and a stabilization of the synaptic function. So that can improve uh, epilepsy, but it can improve also other cognitive and, and, and behavioral problems. And what about all these um, and mutations that produce a gain of function. So we can block the receptors and use some antagonists. We can decrease glutamate release using uh, one a conventional uh, anti-epileptic drug, or we can even um, increase the reuptake of, of glutamate in order to de decrease the, the, the quantity of glutamate as an agonist. We will explain a little bit that uh, here later, later on. So, uh, we can, uh, oops, okay, so this is, we can, uh, in fact, uh, try to, to decrease the amount of glutamate. If we have an, an hyper excitability in the NMDA and the excitatory molecule is glutamate, maybe we can decrease release of glutamate. And lamotrigine is one of antipileptic drugs that can, be, can do that. But this is just a theory, an idea that comes from the theory. I, I, this is not, has, hasn't been proved. Uh, we have some blockers that have been proved, like nemantine, ketamine. Uh, there, there is a publication of radiprodil, we will see. And another archon will be dextromethorphan too, that can block NMDA receptors as antagonists, not agonists, but antagonists. They block the function. And then some antibiotics, such as uh, amoxicillin clavulanic, uh, increase the expression of this transporter, which is the excitatory transporter of the glial cell. So they remove glutamate from the synaptic cleft in order to decrease the, the quantity of glutamate. So if we have less glutamate, we will have less activation in, in this receptor that is uh, already overactivated. But this is just an idea and it has not been proved. It has been proved in other conditions. Uh, this is a, a very uh, recent publication showing the effect in vitro of the, the different kind of, of drugs that have been proved to block NMDA receptors it, it, it has been proved in particular in green to D, and and well they, they have a similar uh, effect in fact, and this is uh, the the publication of uh, with radiprodil that is a, a um, uh, NR to B negative allosteric modulator to treat in, and it has been proved to treat patients with infantile spasm, and that uh, after some months. 11 months, 10 months of follow-up, they, they remain spas-free. So it, it, it can have maybe, an, it is an option maybe in the future for, for this patient. And, and well, just a, a comment here. So is this loss gain of function approach useful to design personalized therapies? 
um, we, we think that yes, for sure, and, and, and it, it works in, in some patients also in other neurodevelopmental diseases, for instance, in, in this channelopathy, KCNQ2, that there is a, so car carbamazepine, which is an antiepileptic, can totally restore some, some of, of a specific mutations. So we really we strongly believe in this approach, but it has limitations because it may be too simplistic, uh, because the activation and inhibition of glutamatergic neurotransmission has multiple regulators and, and we know um, little about these um, mutations in terms of the whole function of the, of the, the brain as a system, how other um, I mean, secretives are affected, what other biochemical uh, markers could behave in this excitatory inhibitory um, balance. So there is also a temporal window with uh, so for some particular um, ages uh, where uh, moments during development where these um, treatments can work and then stop working in, in, in when the, as, as the child uh, grow up. So, in fact, the, 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 there is a complex network of glutamatergic GABAergic circuits that, um, I mean, glutamatergic are much more abundant than GABAergic. So, and even if a glutamatergic neuron is going down in function, the global uh, excitatory transmission compared to with inhibitory, inhibitory is higher. So we don't know exactly the final balance in the brain, even in the loss of function mutations, how, how does it work? And I will finally mention this. This is another totally different approach. It is a, is a recent paper also about immunotherapy in these diseases. So immunotherapy uh, consists of giving immunoglobulins. It is given normally when there is a problem of, uh, um, of immunity, autoimmune problems. So the body produces antibodies or so substances that block a receptor and, and, and impairs function of, of neurons or other organs. So here, these immunoglobulins try to remove these uh, um, antibodies in order to, to, better, to, to have a better function. And, and this has been proved in, 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 four, uh, in five uh, children with different diseases, green to A, green to A, green to D also. And, and uh, what they found is an improvement of the EEG and also some uh, mild response in some other cognitive and, and global functions, uh, but also in the, at, at the clinical level in terms of epilepsy, because it has been described for a long time ago that there is a relationship between epilepsy, inflammation, and these immunomediated mechanisms. And maybe here in that there is, this is a single paper, but this is something that also have a role in the treatment of, of uh, green-related disorders. So to conclude, these disorders are a group of young disorders because it is 10 years from the first description. Uh, so we, we know already a lot, a lot, because 10 years is, is a very short period of time, and, but we, we still have a lot to learn in the future it is important to develop precise and detailed characterization from a clinical molecular point of view, also research model, models, and these will help to, to, this, to define um, the therapies. And, and uh, probably this is the most important message. We need a collaborative work, network of clinicians, researchers, patients, in order to work together, because the only way to face complex problems is working together. Collaboration is the main, one of the main impo important aspects in human evolution that has contributed to the, to the major improvements of, of, of humanity. So that's all. I'm sorry, maybe I have been too, too, too long. <laughs> the, the, the exposition has been too long. This is our group, uh, but uh, for sure, the Barcelona Green Team is the major contributor of, 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 of everything. So, well, thank you very much. Sorry for, for, the, for the time. Thank you very much, Angels. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so we're just going to give um, uh, the, uh, the next pre to our next presentation. Uh, Natalia will be presenting about the uh, El Serene trial. We'll take the questions at the end of this block. Um, hopefully, we'll not go over. So I, I leave it to Natalia to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Sandra. Uh, did you 
Do you hear me? Yes. Um, well, um, uh, good, after, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my presentation. Uh, I'd like, uh, first of all, to thank to the organizers of this meeting for giving me the opportunity to share with you our uh, serine clinical trial. Uh, I'll divide my talk uh, between uh, two main parts. Uh, I'll, I'll begin uh, by giving you a brief overview about the uh, L-serine. Then I'll explain how L-serine uh, works at NMDA receptor and the way that uh, serine uh, could help our uh, children with green patties. And in the second part of my talk, uh, I'll, I'll um, introduce our uh, serine clinical trial. Well, uh, to start, serine is an, an amino acid. Uh, an amino acid is a building block uh, for protein. And serine comes um, in two forms. The first one is L-serine, and the second one is the D-serine. L-serine um, can be consumed uh, by the diet, and, uh, and also it can be made in our body, while uh, the serine can only be made in brain uh, by serine racemase from the L-serine, and is the D serine that acts as an agonist in the NMDA receptors. L-serine uh, is um, um, distributed in, in the aliments, for example, in soy products, in eggs, in meats, sweet potato, and is it a form that uh, it could be uh, fine as a dietary supplement. Indeed, L-serine is considered as grass, generally recognized as safe by the FDA, and has been approved as a normal food additive. Um, serine is needed uh, for multiple functions in the body. It's needed for the metabolism of fats, fatty acids, uh, cell membranes, uh, cellular proliferation, uh, for healthy immune system, and as a neuromodulator. About indications of serine, L-serine dietary supplement has been used for many years in pediatrics at dose of 400 to 600 milligrams per kilo day for the treatment of serine biosynthesis and transport defects with no reported adverse events. And uh, the last years, serine uh, received renewed attention as a potential therapy for schizophrenia, depression, uh, Alzheimer's disease, ALS. Uh, it also works as a um, human sleep inductor. And uh, moreover, uh, uh, serine uh, has been used as a procognitive, um, uh, um, works as, uh, with procognitive effects in healthy individuals. But how does L serine work at NMDA receptor? And um, especially serine, uh, uh, what can serine do? By, uh, for our patients with um, a green patty. Well, uh, I'll, I'll try to explain with the following uh, graphic. Uh, here uh, is, uh, you can uh, see the NMDA receptor. Uh, the NMDA receptor are the, one of the main um, uh, important um, neuro, uh, excitatory neurotransmitter. Neuro, uh, NMDA receptors, I, sorry. NMDA receptors are receptor, uh, receptors uh, mostly composed by four subunits. Two, uh, D serine uh, glycine binding glue N1 uh, subunits encode by green one gene, and two, glutamate binding glue N2A and glue N2B <coughs> subunits uh, encode by green 2A and green 2B gene sp specifically. Therefore, the existence of green gene variants can uh, disturb the function of the NMDA receptors, and this dysfunction may lead either of a gain uh, of function or a loss of function of the, of the same. That's, uh, in other words, that's why this serine uh, can uh, help 
uh, pay, uh, our patients with loss of function uh, variants activating, activating uh, this receptor. So uh, once uh, your child neurologist uh, determined that your child is carrier of a green uh, gene variant, uh, it is important to define uh, two things. The first is defined if it's a real pathogenic variant uh, disease causing, and the second is uh, to determine the functionality of the receptor and uh, its annotation. Uh, if the receptor acts like a, a loss of function or uh, with a, a gain of function of the, of the receptor. So please remember that serine acts act, um, mainly in, in patients with loss of function uh, variants. And uh, in a proof of concept, uh, our group uh, have determined uh, that, uh, that agreeing to be a variant with a loss of function uh, can be rescued by uh, l serine supplementation. And according to this finding, uh, they, uh, they have recently described the, the beneficial effect of chronic l serine dietary supplement in a, a green, uh, in a five year green to be a, a girl. And she showed an improvement in both uh, motor skills and in um, in psychological function. Well, in this uh, second part of my of my talk, I'll, I will explain about our uh, serine clinical trial. Uh, and let me only this slide uh, to explain uh, to you why it is important, um, why clinical trials are important steps for discovering new treatments. Uh, I, I'll, uh, I'll give uh, five reasons. The first one, and one of the most important, uh, that uh, why we are conduct uh, a clinical trial is because the results can affect many more patients. If I, I conduct a clinical trial and ultimately bring a new treatment, we can uh, potentially impact thousands of, of lives. Second, they bring new treatment uh, to market. Uh, without a clinical trial, participants' advances uh, won't happen. Third, they provide good information. If we conducted a clinical trial, we can systematically test to determine which drug is more effective. Uh, Fourth, we want to make sure that a new uh, treatment is safe and effective before it is brought to market and uh, in clinical practice. And finally, they take out a physician's uh, bias. Well, and uh, finally, <laughs> the, uh, the most important uh, part of my talk, I would like uh, to share our serine clinical trial uh, protocol for patients with green related disorders caused by the, by the presence of green variants leading to a loss of function of the NMDA receptor. Um, after our single experience with the, uh, the girl that I, I, I have talked earlier, uh, we want to translate this unique experience in a bigger group of children with green patits. So um, we, we wrote a project and we applied with this project uh, to a nutrition metabolics research fund and we award a grant. And thanks to this uh, grant, uh, we, we will be able to conduct uh, this uh, this uh, a clinical trial, but it's important to remark that this is not a clinical trial from a pharmaceutical uh, industry. Uh, this is a trial that we will be able to carry out with the grant that we obtained uh, with this with this fund. So uh, our budget is limited, so we will not be able to recruit out a patient outside from Spain. We will start uh, with a recruitment patients from our, from our country. Uh, but please don't be sad about that because uh, uh, let me invite uh, to your child neurologist contacting me uh, because I would be uh, really happy to share with them our protocol. Uh, it will be really nice to homogenize uh, the assessment for each patient 
uh, who takes a uh, serine. Well, about the, the, the trial, we hypothesize that independently of the molecular etiology, NMDA receptors activity potentiation throughout l serine dietary supplement can ameliorate glutamatergic function and improve the life quality of children suffering from GRIND-related disorders. And uh, our second hypothesis is that the dietary supplement of l serine results on increased diserine plasma levels and potentiates uh, NMDA receptors, leading to NMDA receptor functionality. Increase and uh, hyperfunctionality rescue as shown in the pilot study. Sorry, I have to. Okay, sorry. Um, our uh, our the purpose of this study is to, is to determine L-serine dietary supplement efficacy for the treatment of patients with green related disorders caused by the presence of green genetic variants leading to hypofunctional NMDA receptors. We have two primary object objectives. The first one is to know the dose tolerability based on subject interviews and a schedule assessment evaluating the presence or not of adverse events. And the second objective is to, uh, to know the, the efficacy based on neuropsychological and motor assessment. Uh, like uh, such a, a secondary objective, we want to study the effect of l in microbiota composition in for that, and for that purpose, feces from patients uh, will be collected. About uh, inclusion criteria for participate are to be a girl or a boy between two and uh, 18 years inclusive who live in Spain, uh, patients who, who have a confirmed a pathogenic green gene mutation with a diagnosis of encephalopathy associated with genetic green variant pathogenic or likely pathogenic causing a loss of function. Uh, and like another uh, clinical trials, it's, uh, it's essential uh, that parents or legal representative give written informed consent for participation in the trial. And finally, that the patients and caregiver are willing and able to comply with all trial requirements. About exclusion criteria for, for participate, uh, don't have a diagnosis uh, of encephalopathy with a green variant pathogenic or likely pathogenic causing a loss of function. Patients who are currently using or have used within the 30 days prior uh, to a screening l serine supplement. And finally, patients that have been previously randomized into this trial. Uh, about study timelines, our uh, first patient screen, uh, screened was in July, and the target last patient enrolled will be in January uh, 2021. But it is possible that uh, cause of coronavirus uh, cr uh, crisis, the, we, we extend the, the target, uh, the target uh, dates. The enrollment target are uh, 20 subjects who live in Spain, and we are really happy to announce that we already have five patients uh, underway, and two patients of them have already started treatment with l -serine. But of course, uh, this is uh, very soon to give more Inform information about the results. They are only have maybe one month with l serine treatment. About the study design, it's a, a, it's a phase 2A study a, with, a, a single, um, with a single group assignment. The study has a duration of 15 months. Um, all children will receive l, -ser l serine over 12 months. Uh, during the, the study, uh, six visits uh, will be, uh, will be uh, done and, uh, and the examinations will be performed at uh, three months and one day before starting uh, the treatment and one month, three months, six months and uh, 12 months after the beginning of the, of the l -serine. About doses, uh, a total daily dose of uh, 20, uh, 250 milligrams per kilo day of l serine will be given from week zero to week two and from week three to week uh, 52 
uh, 500 uh, milligram per kilo day of, of setting uh, have to be given. Um, well, uh, here I present uh, the template of, uh, of the assessments by visit, where you can find uh, the different neuropsychological, uh, motor, and uh, sleep assessment. As well, uh, we will evaluate the epilepsy with a subject epilepsy diary and with the performance of a EEG evaluation. Uh, here, uh, uh, you can uh, in the in the in the in this table, uh, you can have the frequency of the of the assessments. Well, about uh, Elserin, some uh, only some words. Elser, Elserin will be uh, manufactured, packaged, labeled, and distributed by Nutricia or delegate contractors. It will be present in a powder form of 100 grams uh, of the amino acid. The volume is determined is determined by patient weight, and the dose is the is the following uh, that I have um, earlier mentioned: uh, 250 milligram per kilo day during the first two weeks, and then from week three to 50 uh, to the week uh, 52, 500 uh, milligram per kilo day. And when we must take under consideration some uh, possible adverse event, uh, events that have been uh, reported in the literature in another kind of, of diseases. Uh, mostly are mild to moderate uh, events and uh, they can include abdominal pain, uh, nauseas, dyspepsia, loss of appetite, vomiting, constipation, and less frequent uh, nystagmus acoustic startles or myoclonus. Of course, all of them are reversible, stopping the, the, the serine. Well, uh, before, I, before I finish, uh, let me thank uh, to the Barcelona Green Team, because without uh, their previous and current um, uh, research, this trial uh, couldn't be possible. Uh, of course, uh, here in this slide, uh, there are many collaborators that miss it. Uh, and uh, of course, I, I would like to thank all the clinicians that are uh, contacting us every day, uh, giving information about their patients or genetic study or the uh, clinical phenotype. And uh, I don't want to forget, uh, thank uh, the parents and that, that, uh, our patients because uh, for placing your trust on us every day. Uh, and that's all. Thank you for your attention. I'll be, ha I'll be happy to answer any questions you may uh, have. Thanks. Thank you very much, Natalia. Oh, thank you very much, Natalia. Uh, we have a few questions, so we'll try to go as, as fast as we can before the lunch break. And please, I want to remind everybody if they can fill out the survey monkey, um, it, which is uh, linked in the chat. Um, I'm going to uh, go in order uh, with the questions here in the Q&A, and I have a few more um, they've been sending. Um, so we have this first question. My daughter has a nonsense, but has a profound a nonsense mutation, but a profound and multiple disabilities across board speech, cognitive, physical. Uh, so by Chavi's logic, could uh, she also have another mutation? No, no, necessarily. I mean, there, there is even in the in the same mutation, there is a spectrum of manifestations. So it could um, it it could be the the only cause. Yeah, why not? Yes, yes. We see the. Uh, I mean, two patients with the same absolutely the same mutations can behave in a in a different way, uh, in a very different way or a mildly different way. It depends on every patient. Yeah. Um, we have another question. My daughter is 11 and has never had an epilepsy. Is she likely to develop epilepsy later in life? 
Uh, we don't know. It, it is not possible to know that. In fact, if, if the epilepsy has not appeared during the first uh, stages of development, it is uh, something of a good prognosis uh, because the most severe epilepsies tend to appear early in life. So it is something very positive, but it is impossible to know if later on uh, she could uh, develop epilepsy. But in any case, it doesn't look like she, it, if she develops epilepsy, it doesn't look like this epilepsy will be severe. Maybe, well, maybe she could have a, one seizure or a couple of seizures and then be, be treated um, without any problems. But this is not possible to be answered. We, we just don't know. Hmm. Um, I have uh, another quick question. This is, um, can uh, green disorder uh, be discovered during pregnancy? Uh, because of the, the fetal abnormalities that the... the um, that, that's a very interesting question. If, if uh, uh, let's figure out that... Uh, that there is a problem at the, a brain MRI, well, I'll see, a, a MRI of the fetus and a brain MRI of the fetus is performed and a polymicrogyria or something similar is affected and then a very uh, quick uh, genetic <coughs> test is performed and directed to these mut genes that can produce these uh, brain malformations. Maybe yes, maybe yes, but this is not something that is in the standard test that the, that the um, that it, during pregnancy are, are done to detect um, abnormalities like Down syndrome or other kind of uh, chromosomal abnormalities that are now tested. Thank you. Um, our son is a loss of function, but uh, recently uh, he's been put on lamotrigine for epilepsy, uh, which only started recent in the recent years, and he's already 28 uh, years old. Uh, based on what you said, and given the fact that you can use it for gain of function, could it, this be detrimental for him? No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so, because, well, it has also other, other functions. Uh, so, no, not specifically. I, I don't think so. No, it, it, it depends also on every patient if the response the, the, has been positive and, and seizures have improved. Um, it also depends on the age. I mean, the, the anti-epileptics that, that we use are also based on the type of epilepsy and on the, um, on the age of the patient. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in this case, lamotrigine will be used not only for epilepsy, but as a treatment in general, no? as, as a modulator in general of glutamatergic function in, in gain of function. Mm -hmm. Okay, but even though if it's a loss of function, would it gain of function be a, I mean, the, the way it works would not affect the loss of function too? Um, I, well, it, it, if you only want to, uh, if you want to normalize the, uh, the epilepsy and um, lamotrigine can, has other functions, not only this decrease in the release of glutamate. So, um, I, I did, well, I don't think if, if uh, I mean, the epilepsy is solved uh, and controlled, even if it has a loss of function, I don't think that it should be detrimental because it is not, a, I mean, the, the, the quantity of glutamate that will be removed uh, from, from uh, or will be decreased using this drug probably will not affect the whole balance of having an epilepsy, you know? So, well, it's a question of a multifactorial approach. Mm -hmm. Um, with a nonsense uh, loss of function, uh, would something that makes the receptor work better through an agonist binding be worthwhile? And if there's less receptor, then presum uh, presumably um, something like elserine wouldn't be appropriate that is, as it cannot work on the receptor? Mm -hmm. I didn't understand too much this question. What, what is so, the exact mean? Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Um, I think what it refers to is that if you have a loss of function and you have already uh, a, a trun truncation in this case, um, mm -hmm. adding serine is not going to improve because you actually don't have as many receptors in mm -hmm. the surface as you would if, if you would just add the serine and you would improve the. the mm -hmm. 
yeah so the, the, if, we, if we could uh, add something different of it just uh, elserin won't work at all um yeah it, it is true that it, it, some of these patients um uh, for in our experience that that, that we have had uh elserin works just maybe for for a very short period of time and then it, it doesn't work anymore or it makes a very very poor effect uh, yeah probably other kind of uh, agonies or other approaches are are needed i mean the, yeah you have to to personalize every kind of, of uh, in every patient what what do you uh, choose as treatment mm -hmm. okay. if i can expand a little bit yeah. a follow up of this question because uh, we are currently investigating the the effect of elserin on green truncations and indeed it is working on this uh, small pool of receptors that are still remaining and that they are normal so they, there is a, a decrease on the density of these receptors uh, but at least they can respond and those that are functional they respond to elserin and we are trying to, to adapt the dose of elserin. So these are the experiments that Anna is conducting. And, uh, and also to, to identify new uh, compounds that can have even a higher uh, potentiation of the, of the loss of function uh, variants, not only truncations, but also the others. So yes, the answer is that elserin can be acting, but exclusively on those uh, receptors that are uh, functioning with, with no, with no truncations. Just following a couple of serene questions or, or, or questions in general, um, the, you know, do you see an age issue when treating? I know that you stop the, the, the recruitment for, for the serene at 18, but could the serene or any of these medications help uh, patients beyond that so you know there's some mother has a child who's older uh, over 20 and uh, they want to wonder if there's anything that could work um, or, or they would still see a difference is there any treatment for for these children uh, yes well it can be useful not only for children patients uh, that's because uh, our hospital is a child uh, hospital so we will uh, start uh, with patients between two and 18 years. But if we have uh, good uh, results, of course we can use in, in more, in more uh, patients, yes. Good. Um, I have a question about the Serena uh, trial. Um, there's a family in Madrid that's been waiting yeah. for the <laughs> ethical yeah. committee to go through. And this is just a, a, a question about, you know, how how it works if you can get an ethical committee uh, across a country or you need to get it hospital by hospital and if you have any anything to comment about that and this i think goes to the future of, of trying to get the green community and the doctors uh, working together with us um, in the hospitals everywhere for future clinical trials too yes uh, we know that that's a big problem uh, in the beginning when we uh, uh, create the study the um, the study design was uh, something different. Uh, our first aim was that every patient uh, can come to our hospital and, and that's all. But after a cause of the coronavirus crisis, uh, things change. And with the collaboration of the clinician from the different cities from, from Spain, uh, we'll be, be, uh, we will be able to to carry out the, the study. But the problem is that uh, each of the ethical committee uh, has to approve the, in some cases, has to approve the, the protocol. And in case of Madrid, I know that the, the Dr. Uh, Soto has a lot of problem about that. And we are waiting for the, for the answer of, of their uh, committee. Yes, it's it's not a good uh, are not good news, but it's the only the only way that we have now to to act. Yes. Um, the other question is uh, the the families have read the use of when prolonged use of l serine the use of folinic acid. Mm -hmm. 
Well, this is because uh, uh, L-serine metabolism and folate metabolism are connected. So if we stimulate the pathway of L-serine, we can finally uh, well, use a lot of folate because of folate is needed for methylation uh, uh, reactions all over the brain. And, and, and this can lead us to a secondary depletion uh, of, of folate. That's why this is something that we that we do in L-serine deficiency uh, synthesis uh, diseases in, in, in metabolic diseases that we learn that from, from these disorders and that's why patients with L-serine treatments for long periods uh, are recommended to, to be supplemented with folinic acid. Thank you. Um, I have another question because you mentioned piracetam and, and there's a family wondering if you can use the piracetam with the, the L-serine. Yeah, sure. It makes sense. It makes sense because um, you, what you are doing, but theoretically what you're doing is to improve the uh, binding of agonists to NMDA receptors. So you will improve glutamate, but uh, also the serine in that case. So yes, why not? It, it is, yeah, you can use uh, like multiple uh, treatments if they are safe for sure, that goes towards the same um, goal. So yes, sure, yeah. Um, we have another. Yes, about the EEG in the clinical trial. Yes. Yes, uh, we are not uh, expecting to find something special, but as we know, uh, some uh, patients with uh, related disorders have epilepsy, so we will be, uh, we will take care of all of the possible effects that they will have uh, or not uh, with the elserine. It's only to, to be sure um, that, for example, uh, one patient with epilepsy works uh, with the elserine uh, treatment or, or the EEG works, but we don't expect uh, something special. We have another um, comment here about the serine. So I'm going to try to pull all the serine questions and then we need to break and we can continue on the roundtable discussion, especially the more general ones. Um, the serine, could we saturate the brain with too much L serine? Saturate? Uh, <laughs> well, in another, uh, in another um, kind of diseases, for example, in ELS or neuropathy, uh, they are used, uh, uh, I think, a ther a 30 grams uh, of serine without any adverse events. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, the doses <laughs> that, that, yeah, the doses that we are using are safe doses because it, they yes. have been used in, in other diseases for, for decades, for many, many years, and no adverse effects have been reported. So, for sure, if you give tones of tons of theory, maybe you have a problem, but we, yeah, we try to use uh, doses that are the, the recommended and safe doses. Safe doses yes. Yes. I think maybe what we need to, um, for, would like to hear from you is also, uh, because a lot of families want to try serine, but I think the way to try serine is through their doctor. And ideally, through the doctor, contact you guys and, and take advice from them and not have families just run to the first, you know, amazon.com or whatever and, and, and start trying it. So, uh, because, you know, there's a comment here that their family is trying. How do you see, how can you check for the difference? I think the best way is to have your doctor prescribe it and do the appropriate tests um, in order to even see if there's something going on. Um, there's a mice, um, sorry, a mouse question here. Um, and I'll leave that when Amy joins the call uh, at the end of the round table, um, because I don't think at least she is one of the people doing the mouse and uh, we don't still know of anything about the l serine trial in mice. Um, uh, so with the past experiences from l serine did you see any improvement in uh, in the iq or any other ways of of um, you know any improvement did you see with with l serine in the past 
before the study, of course. Or if you've seen anything with the study, I think it's too early, maybe. Well, uh, in, in some patients, some patients that we treat before that are not in, included in the in the trial and have been treated, uh, they report some benefits. And for instance, well, in attention, um, in in well, the the interest in their surroundings and the the, the social interaction, um, also in 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 particular in in mild cases, those those cases with mild uh, in, uh, in developmental delay or mild intellectual disability they are also able to well to talk a little bit more to communicate more to understand so but that we have not um, evaluated that or still uh, evaluated with objective um, uh, standardized tests so we have to use uh, IQ tests or developmental tests or behavioral tests so these tests that are recommended to have a, um, a validated information because only the, the information that parents give sometimes is a little bit subjective. So, but we, we, we will do that. And apparently, yes, but not all the functions improve in the same way. And this is something that we have to, to study with the clinical trial. We will have this data. Yes, in some patients also the sleep improve, yes. for example, but as Angel said, uh, that's uh, why it's necessary the clinical trial to evaluate in a bigger group of patients uh, the different uh, neuropsychological uh, assessment or motor sleep assessment. There is a one non-English German, uh, a German uh, question as well there. Uh, does the severity of epilepsy change during uh, puberty? or with onset of puberty? Um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, it, this is true that there are some, uh, in general, that there are some uh, developmental periods where the possibility of uh, an epilepsy impairment increases, like, well, at the beginning, during the neonatal period of the first year of life, the, the, the brain is very active, so the activity is very high, so there is a lot of excitability. So here, the, the, the brain is very vulnerable to epilepsy. Puberty and adolescence is also a period of, of vulnerability, and then the very old person, so the, the, the ancient person also. So these are the periods of life where there is more probability. But I don't know exactly in the case of, of green disorders, I don't, don't have personal experience. It, in some series, it has been described that um, more or less uh, half of the patients can like uh, stop the epilepsy that they have previously had. But I don't know, I don't have a personal experience to, to answer this question. Um, for no, example, sorry, in, uh -huh. in, in series of patients with green 2A a mutation, mm -hmm. that's uh, more common to have a landau Kleffner or a specific type of epilepsy related to green 2A mutations during the childhood, for example, than, uh, than when the patient is an adolescent, for example. No? So I think that, yes, but... Mm, <laughs> it's uh, what a uh, series of patients uh, described. Yeah, I think yeah, we have to see, to look at every patient in a personalized manner and see well what is the kind of epilepsy that this patient have or what has been the response to treatments in the past. So just to have a better idea to 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 have a prognosis. But yeah, in a general way, I don't know. <laughs> 